Rise. Once again, the final Gymquisition of the year, and what a year it's been. I became a full-time professional wrestler, I wrote for the biggest indie video game of the year, I grew out my tits and hips to extreme proportions, and I passed the 100,000 subscriber lost mark. Brilliant! Now we're going to talk about the shittiest games of the year. It's the one you've all been waiting for, all 15 of you. The top 10 shittiest games of the year. Take it away, Skeletor. Dying Light 2! Dying Light was a mediocre game, as far as I'm concerned. I realise it has its fans, and a first-person open city zombie game themed around parkour is promising, but I found it a one-note affair with a laborious combat and tedious exploration in an uninteresting world. How did Dying Light 2 seek to improve on the formula with this anticipated sequel? It added stamina to climbing in a parkour game full of climbing. Dying Light 2 makes the list this year for that one sole fact alone. It's the same mundane game as last time, with one of the most baffling player downgrades I've ever seen. Like, who on fucking earth thought making the protagonist objectively shitter at the one gimmick the series has going for it was a good idea? What clown-brained bullshit! Dying Light 2 exemplifies a game design phenomenon I've criticised in the past. I call it skill paring. It's where a game makes the player pour experience and skill points into a disempowered character to bring them up to the standards of the average protagonist you'd expect in a similar game. Not only is Dying Light rendered ridiculous by the mere inclusion of a stamina meter that its prequel never had, the stamina meter is itself pathetically limited, making the character incapable of scaling a vast number of areas without investing heavily into upgrades. It's an active detriment to the exploration factor that Dying Light is supposed to thrive off of, makes upgrading feel linear, and yeah, the game's still a load of pointless wank on top of that. Chocobo GP! Square Enix is on a real fucking roll this year, kicking off 2022 by humping the dry flaky leg of cryptocurrency and going out of its way to swindle its customer base ever since, proving what I've said about the company for years. It's as greedy, shady and corrupt as the very worst offenders in mainstream gaming. It's also proven something else, that live services really are built on trust that has been squandered time and time again to the point where you absolutely should never believe that games touting long-term support will actually be supported. Take Chocobo GP, which only a few days ago suddenly had all support dropped for it despite its positioning as an ongoing game experience. The microtransactions plaguing it aren't going to be refunded, there's been no time given for players to wind down their experience, it just got cut off. Because that's how Square Enix operates now. Fucking suspiciously. The game itself is actually quite good, but that's part of what makes it shitty. This is a decent kart racing game with a focus on family fun, but it's fucking littered with exploitative microtransactions that ruin it. It's got a really manipulative battle pass system that dangles popular Final Fantasy characters in front of kids' faces. It's governed entirely by aforementioned microtransactions. It's simply an offensive example of Square Enix's vile money grubbing. And the fact they suddenly lost interest in it and potentially fucked anybody they tricked into spending extra cash just seals the deal. Again, Game that is not actually bad, but was made with shitty intent and shit all over its own audience. That very much makes it one of the year's shittiest games. And it's not even the only Square Enix live service that was killed inside of a year, but we'll get to that later. Ashigaru! The Last Shogun! It wouldn't be a list without a Gilson B. Pontus game now, would it? Yep, the worst PlayStation exclusive developer in the world is back with another game that does everything you'd expect from a Gilson product. 
Predominantly, it does nothing. Nothing but wank itself into a graphically ugly oblivion, at least. It's gotten so formulaic now that I've coined an entire genre for him, the Gilson-like, a game in which you run across a barren map for ages until you find an enemy who kills you in one hit. That's the general gist of the genre named after a person so inept, so fucking awful at his job, that not only does he fail to improve with each yearly release, he actually gets worse. Ashigaru The Last Shogun is the true fucking pits, a game that doesn't even have any real defensive options in a world that's more threadbare than ever. It's practically designed to indulge the core gameplay loop of the Gilson-like to the point where I'm convinced it's purposefully unwinnable. You can only really swing your sword wildly like a drug-addled dervish, and taking the one hit that'll kill you is basically random, but definitely inevitable. Meanwhile, I've never seen an enemy die no matter how many times it's been hit. I'm not sure if enemies are capable of dying. Dying also spawns you in a different area, sometimes with a wolf that does literally fucking nothing, and it cycles through a small selection of areas with each death as part of a pattern providing further evidence that it's all done deliberately. It's ugly, plays like shit, its entire design philosophy is fucked up, and this year Gilson once again tried to have my criticism of him taken down from YouTube via fraudulent copyright claims. After failing multiple times in 2021 to screw me in this way, it's frankly stunning YouTube allowed him to try again, but that's YouTube for you. Utter fucking bollocks. Diablo Immortal! Diablo Immortal is one of the most openly greedy Activision Blizzard scams on the market, and that's really fucking saying something. A mobile focused Diablo product that the company once unveiled to a whirlwind of prescient booze at BlizzCon. The current plan is to be on mobile, both uh, Android and iOS. Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do a uh, PC. Do, do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys all have phones. Phone, phone. right? Yeah, those booing were always right to have done it, no matter how many conscientious think pieces said otherwise, because Diablo Immoral <laughs> was always going to be an insidious microtransaction pushing parasite that took the absolute with its grinding and potential for player expenditure. Blizzard absolutely surprised nobody but the gullible in this department. They didn't even try to do anything but meet our sneering expectations. It's a game in which you can spend tens of thousands of dollars and not get what you want that makes the free gameplay interminably dull to prey upon the impatient and the neurodivergent in ableist ways we've discussed in the past. A nasty little game from an abusive company that still hasn't answered for the bullying and prejudice that has infested its working environment under the watch of thoroughly evil men like Bobby Kotick and his wagon circling executives. Fuck Activision Blizzard. Melod Story Crew! Here's how magic works in The Last Aura Crew. I feel it's important to describe this because it gives you an idea of this entire game's mutant philosophy. In order to use magic, you have to equip spell slots in the offhand where you equip shields. There are two offhand slots you could use to cast these spells, but you can only use one if you wish to keep being able to use magic thanks to the dumbest mana recuperation a game's ever had. See, while you have potions for healing, you don't have them for mana. Instead, you need to equip a specific melee weapon that steals mana on hit. So yeah, if you want to fling ranged spells, you need to keep getting close to enemies with a gauntlet weapon that has the shortest melee range in the game and consumes loads of stamina. And that's not even the laughable part. No, the ridiculous bit is that this melee weapon, unlike every other melee weapon in the game, is equipped in the fucking offhand slot. Yes, where your spells are meant to fucking go. Just, just sublime. Mwah. The Last Aura Crew is full of bizarre design decisions on top of being a broken, glitchy, awful souls-like with terrible controls and a protagonist that sounds like a whining Tory bitch. Half the stats are worthless, and the game tells you they are. It literally advises you not to invest skill points in your health, stamina, or magic meters because only the other three stats let you equip new gear. Never 
have I seen a game inform me that 50% of its character stats are fucking worthless? But then I've never seen a game have the nerve to charge 60 bucks without coding enemy AI before. Yeah, enemies don't really have an ag range or a line of sight, just a massive 360 degree alert radius that causes them to attack the air in front of them while staggering their way towards you. This game is so monumentally twisted, I reckon aliens might have made it. Scan! Yeah, I'd rather get my girl dick chewed off by J.K. Rowling's dog than play this again. Babylon's Fall! The second Square Enix game on the list of Babylon's Fall is the hilariously doomed live service farce from Platinum Games. It plays like the average Platinum title, but significantly simpler, laggier, and just plain worse, all to make way for online bullshit that doesn't even work properly and plenty of microtransaction garbage on top. The sheer ugliness of Babylon's Fall is something to behold. A scribbly brown textured filter is slapped onto it as a static layer, which made me think my screen was dirty rather than the game was just artistically fucking inept. It's a game nobody asked for and nobody really played. It launched to zero fanfare with a minuscule player base and after only a few months Square Enix announced it was ending support for the game. Just another of the terminally ignorant publishers, ill-advised, poorly conceived, fucking failed forays into desperate get-richer-quicker schemery. I'm glad it fell flat on its miserable face. The medium is better without games like this staining it. Got them nights! There are creatively lazy games, and there's Gotham Knights, a truly shocking game that takes slapdash to dizzying new lows. So many cookie cutter games pad themselves out with recycled bandit camps, but Gotham Knights goes one step further, or well, one step back. It doesn't even have different camps, just the same few areas it intermittently repopulates. This total hack job almost parodies to AAA open world games with just how repetitive, how nebulous, how bereft of original content it is. The usual busywork associated with the genre is amplified to an absolute extreme. What handful of repeated objectives exist are basically all the same thing. Go to place, beat up baddies, that's it. It plays like the Arkham games, but significantly worse, because that series counter-attacks are replaced by a shitty dodge. Considering the game's auto-targeting is unreliable and the twat family will jump from enemy to enemy at random, the lack of counters to cover for this flaw really exposes it. You could get away with shitty auto-targeting in Arkham or Mordor because the counter system covered for it. Meanwhile, Gotham Knights' moronic protagonists will even try to auto-target enemies that are stood behind area of a affect damage and repeatedly try to dive through it even if there are closer enemies, just jumping into the fire over and over again. Incompetent, intellectually bone-fucking-idle, embodying the worst traits of big-budget cash-ins. Warner Brothers ought to be proud. They love that kind of thing. Mechalisto Protocol! The Callisto Protocol is a dreadful Dead Space ripoff. And you know, I don't fucking care if one or two people worked on the original. This game is a ripoff, a pitiful retread with none of the imagination and one button mashing QTE that it regurgitates again and again and again. Scripted ambushes that aren't scary but do drain hit points as the game helps itself to your health and punishes you simply for playing it, even though playing it is punishment enough in the first place. I can I cannot emphasize enough how often this game resorts to the exact same scare over and over. Words will never do it justice. Within the first hour, you've been ambushed by a button mashing QTE about half a dozen times, and that's a modest estimate. It's Hackneyed Horror Bullshit 101, and it's all the Callisto Protocol has. Everything about the Callisto Protocol apes dead space. To an undignified degree, its camera, controls, art style, colour scheme, HUD elements, all liberally replicated in an inferior fashion. They didn't even try to make enemies as inventive as the Necromorphs, stopping at shitty space zombies and calling it a day. Then there's the weird melee oriented combat that copies punch out of all things, where you use the movement stick to dodge shittily telegraphed attacks in a way that keeps moving the camera and focuses on a single enemy so the others can liberally smack you from off screen. God, I 
fucking hate this game. I hate it. God, I, I fucking loathe the Callisto Protocol. It's obscene. Its existence is obscene. I'm a rational individual. <laughs> Sonic Frontiers! Sonic Frontiers isn't just shit. It's comprehensively shit. After a promising first few minutes, the ways in which Sonic Frontiers wears out its welcome with merciless totality is legendary. It's broken, it's ugly, its controls are a disaster, and its own peculiar idea of how physics work leads Sonic to fly off in random directions, clip through surfaces, and generally feel fucking horrible to play. The camera is so terrible at following the action, and so actively detrimental to the experience, it quite literally serves as the game's principal antagonist, a genuinely threatening enemy responsible for more deaths than any single scripted encounter. I'm aware the hardcore Sonic fanbase loathes me, and they've been liberally indulging in performative outrage over my insulting review, and I realise they seem to sincerely like playing this game in between sending me harassing messages laden with worse expletives and hate speech than they accuse me of publishing, but god damn, the old standards are so fucking low. If you think Sonic Frontiers' barren maps and pathetically pointless busy work counts as a serious high point. Like seriously, you deserve better than this. Even when half of you act like cunts. You deserve better than a map filled almost entirely with the worst versions of Ubisoft style radio towers in video game history. Multiple missions where the objective is literally to just mash a button for five seconds and that's it. I mean literally. That's actually it! That's gameplay, allegedly. By far the most directly offensive thing about the game is the fact it resembles a bona fide asset flip. The much touted open zone maps are brown, dead and lifeless, sometimes green dead and lifeless or grey dead and lifeless, vast open fields without any meaningful architecture, while various props like springs and grind rails are haphazardly scattered, usually just floating in the air. There's a distinct lack of artistic cohesion, while Sonic and the various Sonic themed items look like well, Sonic stuff. The surrounding environment is rendered in drab realism, looking more like PUBG maps or basic assets bought from the Unreal store. Sonic looks like he's in the wrong game, a game that was cobbled together by amateurs and wouldn't look out of place on the old Steam Greenlight. The best parts of the game, the linear levels found throughout the open zones, aren't even original lifted as they are from other games. Sonic Frontiers is just broken. It's full of glitches, its mechanics barely work thanks to busted physics and unresponsive controls, its best content is recycled, and its open world design is too threadbare and lacking in meaningful content to even begin to justify itself. Sonic Frontiers is just fucking disgusting. Yeah, that. Ha ha We're done. Yeah, that's it. We're doing the outro now. Yes, we are done. Thank you. What a wonderful, well, not a wonderful year it's been, but what a year it's been. It's been 12 months. And don't that just say it all. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to sign off. Uh, thank you for being with me this year, those of you who still are. Before I go, uh, just a quick plug for my last wrestling match of the year. Uh, I will be in Sheffield for True Grit Wrestling, uh, the same place we do our Spectrum shows. Uh, I will be teaming with my partner Priscilla to take on Nathan Black and Jack Maxwell. Uh, other than that, I will see you in the new year for a 2023 that I'm sure will be brimming with positive stories and feel-good moments. Until then, Thank God for me, and fuck off out of my house.